Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the beauty of your word, the connectedness of your word, the power of your word, the promises of your word, um, the transformational power of your word. Um, we want to be people who are under your word, not over your word. Um, we uh, come and we worship you as the Lord of all history. Uh, I pray you help us today. Uh, you say your word uh, makes wise the simple. And we confess, uh, Father, that we are simple people. And yet you have chosen uh, even the things that are not to usurp the things that are. I pray you give us a great mental acuity uh, today. Uh, I pray you help us think your thoughts after you. I pray that Jesus will be magnified in our minds uh, this morning. And I pray that you use something as ordinary as a college class to um, meet with us, to change us forever uh, because of your word today. We make this prayer not claiming any inherent superiority to anyone. Uh, we aren't claiming to be better uh, than anyone. In fact, we're uh, confessing the opposite, that we're just like all other people. And yet, in your uh, sovereign mercy, you've given us grace, and I pray that that grace would continue to have great power in our lives. For we make this prayer, prayer in uh, Christ Jesus name. Amen. All right, well we're looking um, at uh, the life and call of Moses today and it uh, is a section of scripture that has a lot of things that will bring us uh, questions and so this, this is going to be a good um, opportunity for us to think through uh, some of these, not least of which is this idea of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. Uh, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and yet uh, God uh, said before it happened that, that that's what was going to happen. So how do we think through that? Uh, as always, uh, please take attendance quiz 18. Uh, helps us keep track of things. Um, and uh, as always, uh, enjoy uh, when uh, some of you have volunteered uh, to introduce themselves to the class. Who who bless us today uh, with that, uh, telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Oh, tell us about that. <laughs> was it terrifying? Uh, no, it wasn't that scary. My sister, she was scared to death, but I, I had a good time. I'm they good. they strap you to an instructor, right? And he's the one who uh, jumps out of the plane, and you just kind of fall. Uh, he let me guide us down a little bit. <laughs> and, and where did you do that? Uh, Chattanooga Skydiving. Oh, I've seen the signs. Uh, been tempted, but I'm a little too old maybe for that. Uh, um, uh, so t tell us uh, something interesting about Decatur. Uh, not a whole lot, Decatur. I guess where I live, um, all the, I live close to the refuge mm -hmm. over there by the water. All the sandhill cranes flying over. Oh, nice. I hear that's really pretty. Yeah. And is there a Decatur High School or something? No, they got Maystone. Uh, so it's interesting that my college uh, roommate's dad started his career at, as the principal of that high school, and he ended up being the president of um, uh, what, are, what is our accrediting? for uh, SACS, the Southern Association of College 
in school. So, like, the the entity that accredits us uh, is Sachs, and so the guy who was uh, uh, principal of that high school uh, is was over it, and his son was my college uh, roommate, which was kind of interesting. So. Good. Well, thank you. And, to, and Hayden, very good. Thank you, Hayden. All right. So we are looking at the life and call of Moses uh, today. And when we come to this story, probably a question that we should ask is, what does God want me to come away with from reading this story of Moses? Um, what should I think of his life? Um, why did God call him? Is, is Moses, like, especially gifted? Or is the story God showing grace uh, to someone who doesn't deserve grace. How do we understand the life and call of Moses? So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and before we start, what did you find interesting uh, as you read through the passages? What questions did you have? What observations, maybe? Uh, was there something that you uh, uh, went over and said, wow, I, I don't think I ever had seen that before? Or is it very early in the morning to be doing? Yes. I just think all the parallels from his birth to the Pharaoh and uh, Nero or uh, Herod trying to kill their children. We have that parallel just his life and Jesus' life. Then you have him fleeing from Egypt and Jesus flees to Egypt. So it seems to be a lot of like Yes, there's a recapitulation that happens. So when you think about it and you read the story of Moses and all the details, and then you read the story of Jesus, it's like the text is inviting us to realize that there are elements in the story that are connected. There are things that are the same. There are things that are different. And one of the ways that... Um, that we'll understand the Bible better is when we start asking those questions. How, how is Moses like Jesus? How is Moses not like Jesus? Good. Uh, any, anyone else? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's uh, out of Egypt, I've called my son. You you go to Hosea and you think that has nothing to do with Jesus. And yet Matthew says, yes, it does have something to do. And so um, how is it uh, like? I, I wonder if that passage isn't a, something like... Uh, um, an engagement um, that I heard of. Have you ever had friends who've had like elaborate engagements, like, you know, really, um, you know, pulled out all the stops when they got... I heard a story of a young lady whose fiancé um, asked the girl's parents, um, just trust me here, uh, will you pack a suitcase for your daughter and don't tell her um and of course this is all above board and they trusted the guy and so they packed the girl's suitcase so the guy picks her up for a date it may have been here in chattanooga but they drive to the atlanta airport and uh they fly to new york uh, city 
and um, they go to a place called Tavern on the Green. Has anybody heard of that? It's like the hardest place to get a dinner reservation. It's like four or five hundred dollars for two people to eat there. So anyway, he had gotten uh, reservations, and he's just telling the girl, "Trust me, trust me." And so she's there, and even when he's got her suitcase at the airport, he's saying, "Just trust me." So takes her to Tavern uh, on the Green, and they have a great time. And he had a rental car, and he said, uh, let's go for a drive. Um, and she says, okay. And so they drive from New York uh, to Philadelphia, which is not that far. Um, and so they're just driving down this kind of random highway, and um, and there's a place, a, a beautiful church, and the guy says, uh, let's, uh, let's pull off and look at this church. And it happened to be where the girl's mother had gotten married. And so pulls off there, walking around. And uh, all of a sudden, she turns around. The guy's on his knees, you know, proposing. She says yes. And then, like, 200 people come out of the woodwork to celebrate this random thing, you know. Well... Do you see how that story is kind of an intertextual echo of another story? Like that guy figured out, hey, this would be really cool if I proposed to this girl the same place where, where mom got married, you know? That's an intertextual echo. And that happens all the time in the Bible where things happen and then other things happen and we're meant to record or to interpret one event in light of the other. You know, just by way of poll, how many think that's a pretty cool way to ask somebody to get married? Yeah, like, do you think he, uh, that guy won that girl's heart uh, doing this random thing, you know? Uh, it's like, yeah, that's like uh, Hall of Fame uh, right there. And to you men, uh, when you decide to get married and ask don't just think about five minutes think about something good right this is going to be with you your entire uh, life so uh, do a good uh, good job uh, so what else did you find interesting as you read through the text all right well uh, let's dive in and look at some of these so want to make the case that i've been trying to make throughout this class, that Moses is saved by grace. God did not pick Moses because he was a good person. God picked Moses uh, and saved him by grace. The second thing I want to try to argue today is that God intends Moses, the lawgiver, as a type and as a contrast to Christ. That is, he foreshadows Christ, and then he contrasts Christ, so uh, positive and negatively. And then we're going to look at Moses and the meta narrative of Scripture. So, just some interesting facts about uh, Moses' life. He lives 120 years. So, uh, his life is 120 years long. And his life falls into three sections. Uh, the first section comes up until uh, he thinks he's the redeemer and he kills the Egyptian and then he has to flee for his life. Then he sp spends 40 years in the desert and God comes to him and calls him. And then the last part of his life, everything he's known for, is what happens between uh, 80 and 120. Now, did you know that Moses wrote one of the Psalms? Did you know that? Uh, so it's actually Psalm 90. It's the beginning of book four of the Psalter. Uh, and it says, the prayer of Moses, the man of God, you have been our dwelling place. So maybe Moses wrote this uh, um, you know, after a period of uh, difficulty, he says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place. A thousand years in your sight is but as yesterday. When it's past or as watch that 
ends the night. You know, you you wake up at four o'clock in the morning and you think, why did I wake up at four o'clock in the morning? The next thing you know, it's, you know, seven o'clock and the alarm's going off. Um, that's what a thousand years seems like to God, just nothing. Moses says that. Moses says, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Moses knew what it was like to have iniquities. Moses knew what it was like to have secret sins. But then we have this really strange verse. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength they're 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone, we fly away. That's really interesting in light of the fact that maybe Moses wrote uh, Psalm 90, and he's saying, you know, normally people die here, and if you're really, really strong, you know, you die here, and then God shows up and says, I've got a job for you. If Moses' life was a soccer game, then his entire ministry was in, what do they call that? Extended time or pep? injury time? What do they call that? Extra time. So Moses' entire life, his ministry, his real ministry, is after the game in his mind was over. Um, God's picking a very unusual person. I love uh, the great teacher Henrietta Mears, a very good uh, curriculum writer, and um, she uh, served uh, the Sunday school movement very well. Uh, She quotes D.L. Moody, who says, uh, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody, 40 years learning that he was nobody, and then 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. Um, So this is the story. During those uh, many days, the king of Egypt died. So this is after Joseph had done all uh, he did to save Egypt and to uh, deliver them out of famine. But that guy died and the people of Israel groaned because of their uh, slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant. Now this is years and years and years. God remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. I don't know why that text is so powerful to me. It's almost like the grammar of it doesn't work. God saw the sons of Israel and then, and God knew. God knew their suffering. God knew their groaning. God knew what he was going to do. He saw and he knew. Moses' life is in the context of God knowing. Moses was God's choice as a deliverer of enslaved Israel. God could have just spoken Israel out of existence. But he didn't. Israel had... Uh, wickedly raised themselves up against God. They had forgotten what Joseph had done. They felt like they had made it on their own and they felt like it was okay for them to oppress God's people. And God knew what to do. And instead of just judging them, God sent 
an unlikely person, a person in the world's eyes that um, wasn't going to do anything. God saw and God knew. God chose Moses as the deliverer. And then the text tells us this, and I want you to remember this. Um, it says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. Now remind me who Levi is in this story. Who's Levi's mother? Is it Rachel? The one Jacob should have married? Or is it somebody else? Somebody else. It's Leah. Uh, Reuben is rejected because he slept with his uh, um, father's mistress. And then the next two, Simeon and Levi, are the one who killed that whole town, you know, because their sister Dinah was raped. The Levites are the ones who are going to end up being the priest. They're actually going to uh, fight against Israel uh, when Israel had um, uh, given themselves over to idolatry. Uh, all the priests come from the Levites. And so in this story, Moses comes from uh, the Levites. So this Levite man married a Levite woman. She conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was fine, kind of interesting in the Hebrew, when she saw that he was good, that's that same phrase. And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. It's the same exact phrase when it says Eve saw that the fruit was good. It's the same phrase when the sons of God saw that the daughters of Adam were good. So we're kind of here and it's like, what exactly does that mean? But she hid him three months. And the reason she hid him is because the Pharaoh had decreed that all the babies be thrown in the Nile River. The Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you will cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This part of that narrative lets intermarry with the Hebrews and will get their stuff. So he's not the first one to try that. Uh, he's trying it here, and he wants to help that scheme by saying, kill all uh, the Hebrew males. <coughs> Throw them in the Nile River. Now, I don't know if you know much about moms, but there's this really weird thing that happens when a woman has a baby. And that is love just seems to spring out of nowhere. And a woman has a baby and there's an instant bond with that baby. So how wicked is it that this man who supposedly is the greatest, most powerful ruler of the most powerful country is commanding these enslaved women to throw their own children in the Nile River? And he's doing it at spear point. He's making the, those women take their own children out and throw them in the Nile River and drown. How bitter is that for those women? Does it make you mad that a powerful man would make a helpless woman throw her own child in the Nile River. Well, this is what God's going to say to that man through this. God is bringing judgment. And God comes to the most powerful man who ever existed at that time, the Pharaoh. 
And he says, the only reason you're alive is because I've determined to destroy you. Because there's this little girl, her name's Rahab, and she's sexually trafficked right now. And you only exist because I want her to hear the gospel. And I'm going to throw you in the Reed Sea. We're going to come back to that Red Sea, Reed Sea. And the Pharaoh laughed. It's never going to happen. It's not going to happen in a million years. You can send all the armies of heaven and you can get me in the uh, Reed Sea. And God says, you know what? You're going to do exactly what I've commanded to happen. And you made these women throw their babies in. And I'm going to make you throw yourself in. <laughs> Who do you think you are? And God says, we'll see. And so Pharaoh hardens his heart and he repents. And he hardens his heart. God hardens his heart. He repents. Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then Pharaoh throws himself in the Reed Sea. Is that just that God threw him in the Reed Sea? He commanded women to throw their own babies. God is a God of great mercy. But it's a misrepresentation of God to think that God isn't a God of justice. God gives people what they deserve. And Pharaoh was doing this and God knew. And God knew that the Pharaoh was going to foreshadow another wicked king. A king who heard that the Messiah is born and who tries to trick the Magi. And Magi, by the way, are those people that Daniel had interacted with 500 years before. 500 years later, they're still looking for the Messiah. And when they realize that, when Herod realizes that the Magi tricked him. He said, well, I'll just fix that. I'll just kill all the babies. And so he ordered, uh, I think it's a nine square mile area. So if if you think from like here to Sail Creek, but, Q, you know, squared, uh, that's what Herod said is just go find every baby you can in that area and just kill them all. I'll kill them all. And... God knew. God knew the wickedness of Herod. There's a connection between what's going on in Moses' life and what's going on in Jesus' life. So Moses' mother was under a command to throw her baby in the Nile River, and she didn't do it, hit him. I guess she pretended to still be pregnant, you know? Uh, and after a year, people started talking and saying, I thought she was pregnant last year. And so Moses' mother, who apparently knew the Noah's story, said, if I have to throw him in the deadly waters, I'll throw him in, but I'm going to build an ark around him first. And so that's what she did. Um, this word basket uh, in Hebrew is the word teba, and it's the exact same word as Noah's ark. And so just like Noah had covered the inside and outside with pitch, and then the deadly waters came down, but there was salvific space inside, Moses' mother uh, uh, was religious enough to say, okay, they're going to make me throw him into the river. I'm going to put him in the river, but I'm going to put him inside of an ark first. And so that's what she did. And she placed it among the reeds by the river bank. 
And it's interesting in Hebrew that this word, among the reeds, it's this word suf. And uh, I think we're going to have a talk um, in the future about the crossing of the Red Sea. And it's clear it was the Red Sea that they crossed. But when God describes the Red Sea, he calls it the Reed Sea. And that's confused many scholars. You know, why is he calling the Red Sea the Reed Sea? Yam Suf. Well, God's saying, okay, you threw my kids in the reeds. I'm going to throw you in the reeds. And I'm going to throw not only you, I'm going to throw your whole army in the reeds. You killed my little boys. I take great offense at that. So repent, because I don't want to destroy you. But know this, if you don't repent, I'm going to throw you all in the reeds. And the Pharaoh says, well, I don't, I don't know who Yahweh is. And moreover, I'm not going to let the people go. God says, okay, we'll do it your way. And so he decreates uh, the Egyptian world, just like he created the universe with 10 words. He decreates Egypt and he starts striking at Egypt's gods like the sun and the Nile. And he... Uh, brings those uh, judgment against those. And Pharaoh repents, and as soon as he repents, God shows him grace. He's teaching him, hey, if you'll repent, I'll show you grace. But as soon as God takes away the grace, he goes right back to where he was. And he won't let the people go. And so finally God says, I've had it. I've had it with you. I've had it with your army. You think you're so great. This is what's going to happen. And God, the the nation of Egypt ends up paying Israel to leave um, because they know God uh, is uh, serious about this. The salvific space in the ark, which saved all humanity, in the Moses story is reduced to the person of the deliverer, Moses. That is, all of humanity becomes one person, Moses. Do you know another place in the story where all delivered humanity becomes one person? His sister Miriam I don't know if you knew this, but Miriam and Mary are the same word. Have you ever wondered why so many uh, little girls in the New Testament are named Mary? Okay, they're naming the little girls after Moses' sister. His sister stood at a distance to know what would be done. Now, the daughter, just by chance, just by chance, the daughter of the Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. And while her young women walked beside the river, and the reason they're walking beside the river is they've got sticks and they're driving off the crocodiles. Uh, So they're walking along, and she sees the basket among the reeds, and she sent her servant woman, and she took it. She opened it and saw the child, and behold, he was crying. And she took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. It won't hurt anything if we just let one of the boys live. We'll still kill all the rest of them, but it won't hurt anything. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Wow, this is like lots of other stories. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse? That is, shall I go call a woman who's just had a baby so she can breastfeed this baby for you. The Pharaoh's daughter said, go. So the girl went and called child's mother, child's mother who had built a little ark that got him saved. And the Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me. 
and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. God orchestrated it so that the Pharaoh's own household paid for the deliverer. When the child grew older, and when we put the whole thing together, he's 40 years old when this happened. Um, or Sorry, not this one, but uh, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Evidently in uh, it, the Egyptian language, the word draw out is similar to the word Moses. And so she names him draw out or pulled out of the water or something like that. God is so sovereign, he thwarts the Pharaoh's will by using Pharaoh's own family. So there are parallels between Moses and Jesus. Wicked king tries to kill God's redeemer. Moses expounds the law on top of a mountain. Uh, there are five sections in Moses' book, the Pentateuch, that's what Pentateuchos means the five scrolls. Uh, that deliverance happened at Passover, and it was meant as good news to all the nations. Well, when Jesus was born, a wicked king tries to kill him. Matthew tells us that. Matthew tells us in Matthew 5 that Jesus expounded the law on top of a mountain. Matthew divides his gospel into five sections. And when Jesus finished, and when Jesus finished five times those exact phrases, Matthew tells us that at Passover, Jesus' death as the Passover lamb freed his people. And the good news was good news to all the nations. There's a parallel between Moses and Jesus. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas! This people has committed a great sin and they've made a God of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin, then do. But if not, please blot me out from your book, which you have written. Moses is willing to give his life so that his people would be saved. And Jesus is willing to give his life for his people to be saved. Moses preaching his final sermon, this is hours before he dies, says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. This is according to all that you ask of the Lord your God in Horeb on the day of assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Let me not see this great fire any more, or I will die. And the Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up um, uh, from among their countrymen someone like you, and I'll put my words in his mouth. And he will speak to them all that I command him. And it shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he has spoken in my name, I myself will require it. But when we read the whole story, we figure out that God's solution is to become a human being and to become someone who looks helpless and who says, let my people go, uh, do to me whatever you want, but let them go. And so they do to Jesus whatever they want. And in killing Jesus, Jesus is unmurdering all those who would ever come to him by faith. By faith, uh, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. <clears throat> he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand but they did not understand <clears throat> it's interesting in hebrew this is the word moses mem uh, shen hey and this is the word messiah 
Mem, Shen, Yud, Chet. And you can hear, can you hear uh, Moshe and Moshiach? Can, can you hear how those words are like mimicking each other? Uh, the whole story is how you go from Moses to Messiah, uh, from the one drawn out to uh, the anointed God-man uh, from heaven. Moses is like Christ, but Moses is also a contrast to Christ. And here's how Moses is a contrast to Christ. Remember how Moses at first told us that uh, a Levite married another Levite and they had a little boy who was beautiful. Remember when we read that? A little later, Moses tells us the rest of that story. Amram, Moses' father, took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister. Okay, let, let's let that sink in for a second. Moses' father married his father's aunt. So let me just ask you a question. You know, you ever, maybe uh, you're recovering from a bad relationship or something, you're kind of lonely, you, uh, uh, you know, go on a dating site or something. You ever said, you know, my aunt... You know my uncle, I know, I know he's a little older than me, but isn't that a little creepy? Do you know what the Bible says about somebody who marries their aunt? <laughs> In case you didn't know all the things you shouldn't do sexually, you know, don't under cover the nakedness of your father's sister. She's your father's blood relative. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> I want you to do that. Okay, so who wrote Leviticus 18.12? And Moses' father uncovered the nakedness of his father's sister. So that makes Moses' birth legitimate or illegitimate according to Mosaic law. Illegitimate. If Mosaic law had been applied to Moses' family, Moses' mother and father would be stoned to death. And when they were stoned to death, what would have happened to Moses? Moses would have never been born. Did God save Moses because he was this uber-holy person? Or is God saving Moses by grace? What about premeditated murder? This is what Moses writes uh, it says, uh, he looked this way and that way, and he struck down the Egyptian. Let me just ask you about your own life. You know, if you're doing something good, you know, do you want people to know about it or not know about it? Or if you ever have one of those days where you say, I know that this is right, but I just don't want to do this. What do you do in those times? Do you like go in an inner room? Or do you like get out of people's public gaze? If you're doing what's right, you don't look this way and that way. If you do what's right, you just do what's right. And Moses, I mean, Moses wrote numbers, right? The city that you give to the Levites shall be six cities of refuge where you will permit the manslayer to flee. In addition, you will give them 42 cities. 
you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee. So if you do something and it accidentally kills somebody, then you, you have a place you can go. But if you do it on purpose, there's no place for you to flee. Did Moses strike down the Egyptian on purpose? Yeah. So he was a premeditated murderer. He's disobedient to God. Uh, God said, uh, I will stand before you on the rock and you will strike the rock. God wanted the picture of Moses striking God. Why? Because that was what was going to happen when Jesus died on the cross. The law of Moses was being uh, laid on Jesus for our failures. But God told him a second time, I want you to speak to the rock. And Moses said, "You, uh, hang on, you want me to talk to a rock? I'm not going to talk to a rock. If I talk to a rock, people are going to think I've lost my mind. I'll strike the rock. He strikes the rock and God says, that's it. I'm going to get somebody else. Moses strikes the rock and God rejects him. Moses is an imperfect deliverer because he hasn't circumcised his own children. God almost kills him over it. God isn't saving Moses because he's good. God's teaching us something about God saving by grace. The whole idea is somebody who can get us back to the land flowing with milk and honey, and it's not Moses, because Moses is an imperfect. We're looking for someone who can drive out all the sinful people from uh, the land flowing with milk and honey, and Moses isn't the one to do it. And Joshua, who followed him, isn't the one to do it because they're all foreshadowing uh, Jesus. Uh, the last thing we see, God appeared in a burning bush. I don't know why English translations don't translate this thorn bush. That's what it means in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, any dictionary, if you look it up, will tell you that. But... Uh, English translations don't do it. God gets in the middle of thorns, talking about getting people back to the land flowing with milk and honey. And the reason God did that is because he was going to get in thorns again uh, to bring us fully back. Um, uh, this is the word, sinna, and if you look it up, it means uh, thorn bush. There, this mount of destruction, uh, God saying, I'll get you back. Um, and then lastly, God tells his own name. Uh, I am who I am. And it's this name, the Tetragrammaton. Um, and this looks like a verb that means he will be who he will be. He was who he was, he is who he is, he will be who he will be. Jews won't say this out loud. So when they come to this word, they say this word instead, Adonai. And Adonai literally means my Lord's plural. So just like Elohim is a plural word, but we treat it as a singular, this is a singular word, but we say it as a plural. And this is YHWH. Now, have you ever wondered where the word Jehovah comes from? Like how that fits in the Bible? Well, what the word Jehovah is, is when you take these vowels, the E vowel, the O vowel, and the A vowel, and you put it with this word. So you would end up Yehovah, and they're doing the German. 
So Jehovah is really just trying to pronounce this word that's saying, hey, don't pronounce this, pronounce that. They're all related. But it's this word. He will be who he will be, was who he was. Um, all right, I see my time's up. I'll see you on Friday.